what is going to happen this week? Let's sum up the biggest market moves or asset classes that you think will move the most based on your thesis, based on what we just talked about. I think the it's very clear the immediate thing to focus on is Japan. Right? I suspect that they're probably either starting to interview or are going to interview this week. So you're going to have, I think, some conceivably some major volatility in, on the currency side. I've said this before. I think the currency crisis is here. That then creates a dislocation in the bond market, which I think is what we're starting to see. That then reverses as you end up having the dislocation metastasize into every other risk on asset. All eyes are on how the war in the Middle East is going to evolve, in particular, how Israel is going to respond to Iran's drone strike over the weekend. Markets have not reacted positively last week. What's going to happen this week? Our next guest thinks that a bigger crisis is already here, and this is why it may be bigger. He is Michael Gallet, portfolio manager of Title Financial Group, and he's here to break down the biggest movers of this week and what could happen next to all asset classes. This episode is sponsored by Sheath. Michael, welcome back. You always pick the days when things are collapsing to have me on. I don't know why that is. It, it, my prescience, because I reached out to you last week and I knew something was going to happen this week. No, it's a busy time. Things, everything's going up. Well, it was last week until this week. We'll talk about it. Uh, and and when I reached out to you last week, it was just announced that I think, uh, yeah, it was just announced that Israel was planning for Iran's attack over the weekend with drones. So we know what happened there. Uh, markets are taking a bit of a breather today, but it was sliding heavily on Friday in anticipation of the strike. So we will talk about that. But first, I'm going to bring up some tweets that you made earlier today in the last 24 hours. You've been tweeting a lot. Like the frequency of your tweets kind of tells me how you feel, because like if something's going on, if you anticipate a lot of volatility, you usually tweet a lot more. And, you know, with more intensity. And that's what's been happening. So, uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an excitable guy. Michael. I'm an excitable guy. What can I tell you? I, I encourage people to check out Michael on on, on X now, uh, formerly Twitter, and uh, follow him there. He uh, tweets about his sentiments and what's going on currently. But anyway, you said today, a couple hours ago, yield spike on Japan fear, then collapse on stock fear path. This week can get absolutely nuts. What are you talking about there? So, you know, I think it was back in August when you and I, for the first time, talked about this reverse carry trade scenario that I always thought would be the catalyst for the the long-awaited credit event, which I was wrong on in happening towards the end of last year, but I still think is very likely, uh, given the way volatility now looks like it wants to spike. So, um, okay, look, the, the whole thesis around the reverse carry trade was what? The yen keeps falling. Yen's inflationary. Japan imports all of its oil, basically, which means oil, which is denominated in dollars, becomes more expensive as the yen gets weaker. So now you've got a very weak yen. You've got a bank of Japan that doesn't know how to deal with inflation. You've got a country that has to import all of its energy. Energy prices are now going to be spiking because of this conflict with uh, Israel and Iran. And that causes the Bank of Japan to panic. Now, a panic move means they probably have to save the yen. Saving the yen means they have to sell treasuries. That seems like the most likely scenario for the Bank of Japan. That puts yields higher for U.S. government uh, bonds. But then at some point, that reverses. Now, the reason I'm saying at some point that reverses is because of this other thesis, which I've had out there for a better part of nine, 10 months, which is that if you want to save the treasury bond market, you have to really crash stocks, meaning that you have to force the flight to safety back into government debt. So you have this interesting kind of scenario, which I think is playing out maybe real time. Weak yen. Bank Japan needs to panic to intervene to save the yen. Otherwise, it's going to cause massive inflation against oil prices rising with this conflict in the Middle East. That then creates a dislocation in the bond market, which I think is what we're starting to see. That then reverses as you end up having the dislocation metastasize into every other risk on asset. We're going to continue the conversation with Michael, but first, a word from our sponsor, Sheath. You spend a lot of effort investing your money, but do you spend any time investing in yourself? Being comfortable and well put together can improve your productivity and self-confidence, but you can't be at your best while wearing boxers that are too tight or too loose. There's a better way. Introducing Sheath Underwear, the only underwear you'll ever need. Made of pristine moto fabric, Sheath keeps you cool in the summer while working out. It features dual pouches, that keep you protected, preventing things from sticking together. And there are not many underwear brands that do this. If you don't like the dual pouches, then you don't have to use them. Sheath is customizable to your needs and tastes. Is it any surprise that Sheath is also an official partner of the UFC? 
Plus, Sheath has brand new materials like bamboo and mesh for even more cooling comfort while you're working out or just walking around in the summertime. And if you're not satisfied, then simply return your first pair within the first 30 days for a full refund, shipping charges included. Go to sheathunderwear.com slash David Lynn for the most comfortable underwear you'll ever wear. And if you use the code David Lynn, you'll get 20% off your order. That's sheathunderwear.com slash David Lynn, promo code David Lynn for 20% off on your first order. Are you okay. scared yet? Are you scared yet? Not point. yet, because you've, you, you've, you've, you've used stronger language in the past, so I feel like you're just warming up. Um, you want to say we're f- we are f- I mean, you-, <laughs> no, you can't say that on YouTube. I'm going to have to cut that out. You bleeped but it anyway. out last time. It's fine. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, no, I'm not scared quite yet, but I feel like we're getting there. Michael, let's talk about uh, what's going on this week then. So, by the way, there's a big treasury auction, right? That's the, So So, what are you anticipating to happen there? Well, I mean, look, there, there is – I think it, it's true that there is a legitimate risk of so-called failed auctions, meaning the demand is just not there. But again, I go back to I don't think that's going to be the case because if you have a volatility spike, you will see credit spreads widen, and that's what's been missing throughout this entire dynamic – of higher inflation, fastest rate high cycle in history, and these lags. Look, volatility has been suppressed for some time. We are due for a significant VIX, VIX spike anyway. It's just a question of the timing. I thought it would happen towards the end of last year. Obviously, I was wrong on that, even though I think the conditions were there back then. I think the conditions are here again. It is intriguing to me that it's about like a month and a half ago, I said gold is sending a warning. And then about three weeks ago, I said, what if gold's warning is not about the yen? What if it's about war? And this is before anything really was in the head. Yeah, you tweeted this. You said, uh, oh, now just, yeah, you said, yeah, gold is setting a warning about war and the yen. So, yeah. yeah now, it seems to be, now it seems to be both, right? But it seems like gold was actually moving maybe in anticipation of some kind of conflict. Now, going back to this point about the way treasury yields have acted, you get the spike, which is what I think it's happening, and then you maybe have a, a collapse down in yield as stocks collapse. I think people are underappreciating what's happened in the last two weeks. You had two days, Thursday of two weeks ago and Friday of last week where you had stocks very strong and then a reversal and yields dropping on concerns of war, right? I mean, in other words, you saw the flight to safety on the geopolitical risk being sparked. You haven't seen that kind of behavior in treasuries in some time. What I say is the the phoenix rising idea, which I keep getting wrong repeatedly on X in my timing, but I think we're probably closer than ever for that to be sustained. Any kind of a conflict, any kind of a war, if it really does to get, get to be out of hand, and listen, this is how war is. Right. I, I think a lot of people were skeptical of of the strike that Iran uh, did over the weekend. You can argue, argue justifiably so, uh, given the way that it was pulled off and seemingly telegraphed. But war can be very complicated. And no matter how telegraphed something is, it can be there can be mistakes right beyond the intended consequences. I say all that because oil spiking is going to be a real problem for Japan. Japan panicking is going to be a problem for the entire world. Let's talk about this war and what's going on today. Monday, stocks retreated on Monday. I'm reading a CNBC article. Stocks retreated on Monday as rising yields overshadowed strong Goldman Sachs earnings. Um, conflict in the Middle East. Um, uh, are, there's a hopes that the conflicts in the Middle East will not escalate. Okay, why are yields rising? Is it just because people don't think uh, things are going to get worse? This is the this, this is as bad as it's going to get in the Middle East. Well, I think I think yields were rising initially because of the strong retail sales. So you had that kind of effect of the consumer uh, economic strength, that narrative, which caused yields to rise. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I've said for the last three, four weeks, they're going to rug, rug pull everything. That includes cryptocurrencies, that included treasuries. But I think this move in treasuries is more in anticipation of what the Bank of Japan is going to do next. That they are going to they're going to basically flood the uh, world with treasuries to try to support the yen. I'm just I'm just trying to understand what's going on, because if stocks are retreating, Shouldn't yields be falling? They will. I think they will. So, so this is actually really key to this whole point about to save treasuries, you have to crash stocks. Okay, what happened November, December of last year? I think the Fed was worried about something. I think the Treasury was worried about something. It could have been Japan for all we know. Okay, because they got the market to think six cuts were coming. So you had this massive run after a very weak October in November, December of last year in risk on assets, primarily in market cap weighted large cap averages. That continued up until now. Okay. Now, the effect of what happened from November to December was collapsing credit spreads, meaning they effectively liquefied the system without having an event, right? They already did that for us, right, in November, December, which is what leads us to where we are today. They can't really do that again. Why can't they do that again? Because now inflation looks like it wants to reaccelerate. 
the effect of what happened November, December was it caused this concern that inflation is about to pick up again, just like in the second wave of the 1970s, which means stocks at this time are the cause of the inflationary concern. So if you want yields to fall, if we if you go with me on that thesis, that November, December, when they when they liquefied with wars to get the market to, to run the way it did, if that has been the source of the inflation, if the wealth effect from the stock market has been the source of the of this reacceleration of inflation concern, then the best way to break that is to break stocks. This time you break stocks, it becomes disinflationary. That then finally does create exactly what you're talking about, yields falling. But yields on treasury bonds falling, not on corporate credit, because as that happens, default risk should finally start to get priced in. Here's a scenario, and please evaluate how likely this scenario is. The war doesn't escalate. Oil falls. It retraces maybe $60, $70 a barrel, whatever the case may be. Uh, inflation concerns dissipate because oil falls. The Fed resumes its its dovish stance, maybe even cuts rates uh, by the summertime. Stocks start rising. Yields don't behave the way we talked about. How likely is that scenario? Oh, it, It's certainly a possibility. I just don't think it's likely at all. Okay. Look, and, and by the way, that would take off the risk some of the, the reverse carry trade dynamics. I mean, if you even if you go back to August when you and I first talked about this as being a catalyst, I said the issue is not just the yen, it's yen priced in oil. So if oil were to drop, then now that inflationary pressure in terms of importing oil in yen terms for Japan lessens, which means there's not as much of a panic, need, a need for a panic by the Bank of Japan to because of the imported inflation then being less from the cost push side, right? So yes, it's it's possible. Everything is possible. I just don't think it's probable. And I'll tell you something, just given the kind of complacency that's out there, and I'm not a perma bear. I keep going back to this point. I've had this string of consistency in the in the thesis. The timing has been off, but I always thought that it would play out in a way like this, although I never anticipated the war dynamic. It's a whole other, obviously, nasty wrinkle. It, it just seems like this is the way things can shake everything back into some degree of normalcy. Because let's face it, for all the people that scream about the bull market, the Russell 2000, is still below the 2021 highs. You can say from here until tomorrow, that doesn't matter. Okay, but believe me, if some of these companies don't exist anymore, if they are concerned, if there's this concern about refinancing risk, about credit risk by the vast majority of companies that employ people in this country, you better believe small caps matter. Uh, you tweeted about uh, this as well. Collapsing stocks could reverse the wealth effect, bring housing with it, cause a decrease in shelter and drop CPI. That makes sense. So you're Let's go back to that earlier this. point, right? Yeah. So that the, the CPI you're expecting to eventually fall once the market's correct, but that has to happen first. Right. Exactly right. The 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 S and P five hundred is no longer a discounting mechanism of the future. It's a driver of the future because everybody's basically exposed to the S&P, whether it's through their 401ks or their individual positions or NVIDIA's or Microsoft's or whatever it would be. Everything's basically in this large cap, market cap weighted type of environment. Now, I do think that part of the reason why housing has stayed sticky is because of the way the S&P 500 has behaved. If people feel wealthy because their NVIDIA stock is going to the moon and their S&P 500 uh, position and their Qs are rocketing, then they say, you know what? I don't really care about having to pay 7% for a house because I can sell some stock to pay for it. So this whole, this entire CPI dynamic, I really do believe is because of what's happened in the stock market. It's not because of anything else. This is a different type of driver than what we saw in the initial wave of inflation. You break stocks, you're going to break inflation. You break inflation and stocks, you're going to break housing. Finally, after this prolonged period of everyone saying, why in the world is housing still so uh, strong despite supply coming back in, by the way, in, in the housing market. And that, again, should cause yields to fall. I know it sounds like a complicated sequence, but the reality is that's the sequence which makes the most sense given where we are in the cycle. Just to push back on your thesis here, just to challenge a little bit. Um, what's going on right now in the Middle East is causing things to behave erratic, erratically. Yeah. So oil is, this is what I think is going to happen. Oil may go up even more if things don't de-escalate, that's going to push up CPI or at least CPI expectations. Stocks will go down regardless because of war. Stocks don't like war. So you got stocks going down, CPI not going down, CPI is going up because of war. Mm -hmm. Right, It's got two dynamics here. The wealth effect may eventually kick in because it's going down, but that there's a bit of a lag there, right? But the more immediate effect is CPI going up because oil going up. Yeah, uh, no, no, for sure. Okay, so... Well, so I'd argue war is bullish for stocks longer term, just not short term. I mean, at least it's sure. Short, yeah, but, yeah. But the um, I, I guess it's a question of the speed of it, right? Like, like I've made this argument many times before. 
a spike in oil is actually deflationary. It, a spike in oil, meaning if it goes vertical, it's deflationary. Why? Because companies can't respond fast enough and pass that increased oil price down to the consumer, which is what makes it cost push inflationary. It's why generally prior to major recessions, you see an oil spike in advance it, because of the deflationary effect. So to your point, let's say oil moves up, but it's gradual or just stays elevated. Okay. I, I'd be down with the argument that that's probably much more along your scenario. CPI then rises, inflationary, and then you know what stocks and bonds yeah. go through the hell of 2021 again, or 20, right. uh, 2022 again, rather. Right. Um, but I just get the sense that if it really does escalate, it's going to be more a spike, in which case, okay. yeah, it's a little bit scary. Risk. Uh, this is a, this is a tweet you made. Gold is risk off. Bitcoin is not. Really? Why is that? Well, I know I'm going to get the Bitcoin maxis to attack me, but the reality is, uh, look at the price action. Like, like I mean, it, it's very clear that gold wants to keep on pushing higher, and you're seeing these divergences in high volatility. Bitcoin is still largely correlated to the Nasdaq. Sure, that's just fact, right? Uh, now, maybe that changes. It's not me being against Bitcoin. I'm just trying to address it from a behavioral perspective. Yeah, Bitcoin is still correlated. Gold is not correlated. It's very clear gold is not correlated because of this the way it's been behaving here. Now, it, it is. Um, I've made this point too as well. I, I think Bitcoin ETFs are going to maybe, with hindsight, be proved to be the worst thing possible for Bitcoin itself, because the reality is most holders of ETFs don't hold ETFs, meaning they trade them very often. So you're not going to get the sticky money in the Bitcoin ETF side of things, which probably makes Bitcoin ETFs even uh, makes Bitcoin ETFs turn Bitcoin into an even more correlated asset when volatility rises. Thesis, I could be wrong, but it's very clear to me that you know gold just wants to diverge, Bitcoin not so much. Bitcoin going down. Okay, so it's at sixty-two. Let's just talk about Bitcoin for a couple of minutes here. Sixty-two thousand dollars, sixty-three thousand dollars. It was at seventy-three last week, right? So this this is the end of the bull run. You think? Oh, I have no idea. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm a little skeptical of the idea, as uh, as I usually am, that, oh, it's going to go to the moon, it's going to be 100K by end of the year. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to be, as you know, uh, David, very skeptical of narratives. And look, I always go back to this, this my fall back to this point that what leads crashes? What, what is the, the necessary precursor to crashes? It's always leverage. Okay, well, what's the precursor to leverage? It's overconfidence. The way with which people talk about Bitcoin, okay, because of the ETF launches, because of, of Hong Kong as well, you know, as far as approvals on the Bitcoin ETF side, the, the, the certainty with which people approach the idea that it's guaranteed, is almost what they're saying, it's, it, the, the crowd, right? It's guaranteed that by end of year, it's going to be 100K or it's going to be more. Nothing's guaranteed. You can't be certain about everything. But if people think it's guaranteed or certain, it creates leverage. That then creates rug pulls because leverage is the precursor to crashes. So it, maybe it does hit that level. I don't know. But what I'm saying is prob probabilistically, uh, I'm skeptical. You tweeted, this is about credit spreads. If U.S. bonds aren't safe, nothing is safe. In the 1970s and early 80s, in a major drawdown for the SPX, treasuries performed considerably better. These are facts. And then you you made a chart. You tweeted a chart. I'll show the chart on the screen. Okay. If bonds aren't safe, nothing is safe. Well, we just talked about gold being a risk asset. So if if everything sells off, gold sells off as well. Bonds, yes, bonds no, are gold the would. ultimate safety, right? That's what you're saying? Yeah, gold. So I, I go back to, uh, I think it was 2011. It was after the S&P downgrade of yeah. U.S. government debt in, in August. Gold was very strong, but then there was a lag effect where gold then sold off, Okay, as everything else was already selling off and treasuries were, were holding while stocks were going down. The reason I think gold would then sell off, okay, it would probably sell go down less in terms of just the pace of the decline, is because when you have a global margin call, people sell whatever is working, So which, which would include gold. Right, they sell their winners, not their losers first. So the disposition effect, which is a well-known behavioral finance dynamic, treasuries I think would stand alone because I go back to the, the the narrative that's out there is just wrong. It drives me crazy. People say treasuries are the the are the junk asset now. No, no, they're the junk asset perception wise because people are not understanding the reason treasuries have not acted like the pristine asset as the risk off beneficiary is because credit spreads have kept on getting tighter. There has not been a pricing in of default risk in corporate credit. In the 70s and in the 80s, this is fact free Volcker, treasuries in major drawdowns for equities were either down less or up. It's fact, it's not my opinion. Maybe this time will be different like 2022 was, the hell that I went through with my own funds because they rely on treasuries to be the risk off option. Maybe that repeats. I am skeptical because when you look at the sentiment and the narrative in the same way that there's overconfidence around Bitcoin, 
there's overconfidence around the idea that U.S. Treasuries are no longer the place to be when the shit hits the fan. You can bleep that out, too. And the reality is the entire system is built on treasuries. If you're going to say treasuries are a junk asset, U.S. government owns us through taxation. You're going to tell me that everything is safe but the U.S. government? That's a joke. What is going to happen this week? Let's sum up the biggest market moves or asset classes that you think will move the most based on your thesis, based on what we just talked about. I think the it's very clear the immediate thing to focus on is Japan. I suspect that they're probably either starting to intervene or going to intervene this week. So you're going to have, I think, some conceivably some major volatility in, on the currency side. I've said this before. I think the currency crisis is here. Right. I think this is which currency in particular. Yeah. I mean, you see the yen okay. Okay. against the dollar in a big way. Right. Which now, by the way, people forget the yen used to be a risk off asset because of the reverse yeah. trade dynamic, which means the yen could actually be a beneficiary. And for whatever it's worth, when you look at the uh, the short positioning on the yen, it's actually increased. So there's a short squeeze potential in in yen that can happen. So I think Japan probably has to intervene. Um, and then I think it'll be interesting to see how Treasury yields respond. They're spiking in a very nasty and aggressive way. Yeah, at least today, Monday, as we're chatting, I would not be surprised. I could be totally wrong. I would not be surprised to see a complete reversal of that by end of week. I go back to this becomes the sequence. Initially, it's a yield spike on concerns of Japan. Everything else around then starts selling off as the reverse carry trade dynamic starts to filter through. And that then creates the demand back into treasuries. But you need to have the yield spike first. You need to have the yen move first. Uh, and you said that nobody is safe. In, uh, in more colorful language, you said everyone is screwed in this. Everyone. So no safe assets this week or beyond? There is no such thing as a safe asset anyway. Just like there's no such thing as a store value. Everything has risk, right? The best thing anybody can do is try to diversify the risk, not by having more securities in your portfolio, but by having non-correlation, which again is why gold has been doing what it's doing. How can anybody look at the price of gold and not say to themselves, what is gold sensing? Gold is not correlated to anything historically. It's not correlated to inflation. It's not correlated to deflation. It's clearly done well with positive real rates when everybody said gold would do well under negative real rates. Why is that? The only explanation is because big money is concerned about something. And when big money is concerned about something and they have to be long only, there aren't that many options. Gold happens to be one of them, right? So I think there's been money that's been seeing this quietly over the last month and a half, those that are really in the know. And you can see in price action. And I still think that, um, yeah, there is a credit event that's out there. I know I sound like a broken clock, but I'm going to keep saying this point. I don't mind being a broken clock that's right twice a day as long as that one minute that I'm right on defines the day. You don't think that uh, there's going to be a massive short covering event this week because everyone was selling off last week? No, not at all. I mean, I don't. Th I, I think the sentiment is so one-sided on the S and P end of things, and everyone's on the same side of the boat. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't believe that at all. The reality is, most people, what do they do? They chase that that which is working. Only a few things have been working, and they're all the large cap tech names and large and 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 market cap weighted averages. Those are the first things to go. Yeah, you brought up small caps earlier. How do you feel about this divergence between large caps and small caps? It's been happening yeah. for about a year and a half now. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I put out that chart. If you look at the um, the small cap to large cap ratio, I mean, you're pushing to the to the 24 year lows. So it's like, which again, it should should make everybody pause as far as just how bizarre this in quotes bull market has been. It's a bull market for a select number of large cap names, and most things are not anywhere near 2020 levels. That underperformance continues. If that were to continue. Even further, I think this whole system ends up being at, at severe risk of a, of a like legitimate recession because, again, there's a message in small cap weakness. Even retailers, for all this talk about consumers being strong and retail sales data, you look at the XRT ETF, the retailer ETF, it's been dead money going sideways. Not, it's not in a bull market. Those that are putting money to work on the stock side are telling you the consumer is screwed despite what these headline economic press releases and data and all the spin says. I don't know. Maybe I'm just fine. I'm like an old man yelling at the clouds and seeing faces in the clouds. But I look at these different dynamics. Nothing has changed. It's taken longer than I thought it would. But the carry trade dynamic becomes the spark for a lot of nasty things. OK, well, well, let's come back to that. By the way, the lumber to gold ratio has collapsed. Collapsed, yeah. By by like a considerable amount for, for yeah. obvious reasons. I mean, gold's been spiking and lumber hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's gone the other way. So. What does that signal to you? I mean, when it moves by this significant an amount. 
So it's not clear if the magnitude really means that much, but it's certainly okay. worth noting, right? So sure, sure. When you actually do a, a back test on it. Um, so basically, lumber has been weak. Wild goal has been strong. It's been a double whammy on the relationship. Yeah. And again, it was it has been correct in, in saying risk off. The signal has been saying play defense. Volatility is likely to rise. What has not yet worked is defense as treasuries. It clearly worked for the dollar. Clearly worked for gold. Clearly worked for utilities, by the way. Utilities relative to the S&P. People don't realize this. For the last six weeks, the most defensive sector of the stock market the utility sector has been outperforming the S&P 500 with everybody still screaming about the bull market. Now, I've done these studies long enough to sh to know for a fact that when you have a strong up move, as the up move is continuing, after some time, if utilities are starting to outperform as that up move persists, that tends to be a local top, Okay, which is why I said also earlier today, unpopular opinion, the S&P correction is probably started. Right? And the reality is most people don't realize you're in a correction until after it's already over. OK, but the point is, like, all the defensive risk off assets have already been warning and leading in advance, except treasuries. I, I think they I, I go back. to I think they are going to stand alone. Now, look, I am biased. I'm biased in saying treasuries because my funds use treasuries as the risk off option. Right. So, so I mean, this just the reality. Right. But it makes sense to me that you break if, if we go back to my thesis that stocks have been the reason for the reacceleration of inflation, then you have to break stocks to break inflation, which will cause yields to drop and cause that flight to safety as Japan is trying to save the yen. But, but why treasuries then? Why not use another safe haven currency? Why not the Swiss franc? Um, oh, you could. Yeah. I mean, and we, I think we saw some action from the, from the Swiss, what, a week or two ago uh, right. when it came to the franc, right? Uh, you, yes, you certainly could. Or you could just play the yen directly. I mean, yeah. that's, well, that's you, the reality. Outline the reasons why you shouldn't do that, but sure. Um, well, because, can... Right, because the issue there, which becomes really, I think, a nightmare scenario is what if the Bank of Japan fails? meaning they try to intervene to save the yen and the yen keeps falling. Like, you know, th there's like no good options here in terms of the way that this could play out. Okay, so we talked about a credit collapse in Japan, currency collapse there. Uh, you've been talking about a credit event in the US for quite some time. Has it happened yet? Is there a catalyst in sight? No, it hasn't happened. But I go back to it's it's because credit spreads are correlated to a VIX. You need to, to a VIX spike. You need a VIX spike for spreads to widen. Again, I still think the risk was very high with hindsight entering November when I was peak bearish. Obviously, I was wrong on the timing, but I go back to why else did the Fed step in? You know, it's like if you're going to really try to float a conspiracy theory, I'll, I'll give I'll give you one which is which I think is is fun. Um, the Fed no the the Federal Reserve is like the Pentagon, right? They probably have scenarios for everything, right? It's like I remember reading uh, somewhere that the Pentagon has like a plan to invade uh, the UK if if it ever came down to it. Right. I mean, they have scenarios, scenario analysis. That's what you do. If you're a big organization, you have scenarios, right? And you, and you act on it. OK, I, I am I am fairly confident the Fed probably has in their playbook. What happens if the Bank of Japan has to intervene to cause a yen spike? I mean, I don't think that's impossible that they probably have that as a scenario. What does that mean for monetary policy? OK, well, let's play that out. Let's say that they they opened up that playbook and they think that that's possible. Right, that in the near future you could have that happen, and you, let's say your your Powell is sitting in November, and you think that's possible, you might want to run stocks up before that happens to give you a cushion in case stocks go down hard because of the Bank of Japan, which means you may want to front run it by getting the market to think six cuts are coming to drive the S and P higher. I know that sounds a little conspiratorial, but I don't think that's that far fetched of an idea. It could very well be that the Fed has been preparing for this all along and wanted to juice stocks in advance. And in that case, treasuries would rise alongside stocks. Treasury right. yields Treasury yields in that case would, would initially uh, uh, fall, which is what we saw in November, December. But then I go back to stocks then as they keep on drifting higher, okay, because default risk keeps on collapsing, causes the reacceleration of inflation, which causes the yields to rise. Bank, it's like this is the whole sequence that then creates the, the drop. Either way, I go back to, I'm not a perma bear. I could be totally wrong on all this. I'm trying to do scenario analysis. I happen to think that this is very high probability. And we certainly hope that war does not escalate. You know, I keep going back to observing a scenario play out does not mean you're wishing for it, all right? I do not wish for this to get out of control with the Middle East, but you cannot discount the possibility that an oil spike has all kinds of domino effects and Japan ends up being the thing that pushes everything over. Here is a scenario, since we're talking about hypothetical scenario uh, probabilities and preparation, what if stocks go up with bonds? In other words, the TLT rises this year alongside stocks. Is there any sure. scenario that can make that happen? 
Yeah, if, if you have, you know, disinflation or the Fed outright cutting rates. I mean, that's really what happened November, December. I right? think the, the, the Powell got the, the market to think that rates were cuts were coming. So the market started pricing and rate cuts as stocks were going up. Right. Well, the, the, if the Fed cutting rates would only affect the short term of the short end of the curve, not the long end. So the long end could still fall. Right. Yes, right. it could. That's right. There is a correlation there. But well, well, sorry, not, the long end could still go up. Yeah, right. Exactly right. No, you're right. It, 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 there is clearly a correlation, but it, you're right. It can certainly diverge from that perspective. But again, I'll back, I go back to it becomes interesting, right? Because if stocks fall hard, if my thesis is right, that that wealth effect has been the driver of this reacceleration of inflation, then the Fed may still cut, but they're going to cut after some real pain, which is what they usually do anyway. The, the whole notion that the Fed would cut rates with credit spreads as tight as they are never made any sense to me. That's why I started writing on Investor Place saying, yeah, you know what? They could actually raise rates with everybody still saying they'll cut rates. Unless you have something break, why would the Fed cut rates? The Fed had, will respond to credit spreads widening. They'll respond to volatility. They'll this respond is, to the Bank of Japan. Somebody asked me this and I said, it doesn't matter what ECOB data they have now. They have to cut rates at some point because they have to protect the credibility. No, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it's a matter of them keeping their word at this point. Yeah, I mean, they'll keep their word if the Bank of Japan gives them the, the excuse. Right, meaning if Japan is the scapegoat because that creates the reverse carry trade, the global margin call, and then they have to step in to say, oh, we have to do this because of what's going on with overseas financial markets. Right, They have to step in and, and liquefy. But it's like the <laughs> Fed credibility. I mean, I think gold is spit in the face of Fed credibility. Gold? Okay. It's spit in the face of it. I mean, gold, you can... I, you know, credit to Mark Faber for saying this all the way back in, I think, 2012 or 2013 of the gloom, boom, and doom report. Um, gold, gold is is the way to short central bank credibility. But by the way, let, let's before we finish off on your work, why did all these assets go up this year? Why was the correlation one on the upside? Gold's up, Bitcoin was up. I'm not talking about this past week. I'm talking about up until last week, right? Gold, new all-time highs. Bitcoin, new all-time highs. Stocks, new all-time highs. Uh, well, the TLZ is down. Bonds are down. Um, real estate hasn't crashed yet. Yes. So it is, it, yeah, we, yeah. So, right. I mean, what was the underlying driving force behind risk assets and risk off assets going up at the same time? It, it was the Fed. It was the Fed getting the market. Well, the Fed they, hasn't done anything yet. No, no, no. But, 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 the, but the, people forget that one of the most powerful tools the Federal Reserve has is moral suasion. It's words, right? I mean, the reality is that by then, think about how insane this is. They got the market to think six cuts were coming, and then four months later, everyone's like, "Oh, no cuts are coming." Ah, uh, like the, the the market liquefied for the Fed. It goes back to the point that the market drives, not the Fed. Right? Yeah. The Fed can can change perception with words, but it was really the market that did it with collapsing credit spreads. After that, I mean, the financial conditions got to be so incredibly easy in November, December. Let's close off from real estate, by the way. Uh, last summer, you were on my show. You were talking about how real estate is in danger because the lumber price was you know, collapsing. That's a that's a leading indicator for housing. Um, it, was all, it was off on that timing, too. Was there, what, 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 what was the surprise to you that uh, it hasn't happened, at least not yet? No, no I, 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 so I go back to part of that thesis around the wealth effect. Yeah. I, think it, I think it was starting okay, into the fourth quarter, but then stocks rallied and everyone said, well, if my portfolio is doing well, then... I don't need to worry about my house because, you know, or buying a new property. Like, I do think that there's a knock on effect of stocks to housing to CPI. It goes back to that, that point. Now, it is interesting also here that, as you know, one of the one of the things which was confounding, okay, was that lumber had been weak for the last two years. And yeah, I get it. Part of that's obviously the reopening uh, COVID issues on the sawmill side, but home builder stocks were also rallying really hard, right? So people said, well, home, you should trust home builder stocks as you're telling on housing strength. Home builder stocks now look like they may actually may have peaked. So now you've actually got confirmation on the lumber side and the home builder stock side. Right. So now it's like, all right, now things are kind of lining up. And the reality is, I mean, I, I, again, I go back to uh, at some point housing has to break. And if housing it has to break because that's the only way you can break inflation, they'll find a way to break housing. Well, unless there's no inventory online. Right. And then it doesn't. Yeah, but that gets, they, honestly, though, that gets resolved over time. And you're seeing more and more inventories coming in. It's just, it's just a lag, right? In terms of the home builders themselves also building, right? Which has been going on for some time now. So, uh, you know, there is, there is, there is liquidity or there's an inventory that's coming on. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but, you know, the reality is that's, that's not as much of an issue as it was a year and a half ago.
Well, how would you respond to the notion that a Fed cut or even just lower mortgage rates would actually incentivize more selling? It, it would. Yeah. So, so I've made that argument also. It's like, you know, if you really want to think of a crazy idea, cut rates and that will actually cause disinflation. Yeah, because then people would actually be able to afford a second, another mortgage. They capitalize on the gains of their first house, right? They take the gains, they buy another house, and they refinance at a similar rate as before. Right. Well, but it's also that if you if you bring the mortgage rate closer to the locked in mortgage rate effect that's causing people to not move from their existing homes, right? You don't have to bring it all the way down, right? But you would unlock even more inventory. That's right. If, right. It's like this. It's, it's a little counterintuitive. It's like if part of the reason why. Uh, housing has been sticky is because inventory has been tight because people are not moving out because they locked in that two and a half three percent mortgage rate against seven. Well, if you bring the seven down to five, okay, now you might at the margin having have some houses be unleashed inventory wise. But by the way, this 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 comment came in on your Twitter space. I know you're streaming this live on Twitter right now. This is a pretty good question. Has anyone talked about the potential for nuclear war between Israel and Iran? Both have nuclear capabilities. I know we talked about the war in passing, but I mean, suppose this really escalates to that point, this this guy's question. I mean, uh, all of what we just discussed is irrelevant. <laughs> well, so my response then would be, I would be the most annoying, bullish person in the world then. I would be screaming melt up from the top of my lungs and I would not be saying credit event. You know why? Because the end of the world is the bull case. Oh, sorry, but I'm confused. Bull case for what exactly? For, for everything, because you can't win on betting on the end of the world. You're talking about a, a nuclear scenario. You might as well buy stocks. It's the same argument I was making, you know, back in October of 2022 towards the low. Well, if, a one's bearish. Goes off, if a nuclear war goes off, you, you might buy stocks? stocks. Yeah, because what's the point then? We're all cooked. All of us. Okay. Yeah, I mean. Well, my point is you can't bet on it. Right? I mean, uh, I hope to God. All of us should hope to God. Obviously, it doesn't happen, but it's like. I mean, you might as well buy stocks then, because we're all probably going to be radioactive. It, it's 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 interesting. Uh, the, the, I've read that the U.S. is reluctant to get involved in a, an election year for a lot of reasons, but also because they don't want to spike the oil price during the election year. That would be bad. <laughs> Which is a joke, because it's like all this is happening at the worst possible time, because we don't have the oil reserves. The, the strategic petroleum reserve is depleted pretty much. What a, yes. what a Like, this is all happening at literally the worst possible time, okay, in terms of our ability as a country to deal with now the Middle East in the in election year when you don't have any kind of a buffer on the oil side. Oh, and by the way, what everybody's still you know talking about uh, uh, meme coins and everybody's still talking about leverage and how everything's going to the moon and how we're in such an unrelenting bull market. It's like nobody is prepared for what could happen. It's not what ev everything I'm saying to you here today is not a guarantee that things go down hard and that the world is going to look horrible in two, three months. We may as well. Yeah, yeah. At least entertain the possibility. That it could play out this way. I'm just trying to provide a different scenario here. We we may as well do a quick election preview. Uh, I mean, we'll we'll have you back on before the election, of course. But are you preparing to allocate your assets? I guess differently under a Biden or or uh, or or a Trump victory. I mean, we're not we're not necessarily picking sides here, but we are planning for scenarios. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it, it had nothing to do with my funds, but generally speaking, generally speaking, um, in during Republican administrations. Uh, commodities and oil, energy stocks and material stocks, they tend to do well. Yeah. Generally, during Democrat administrations, technology stocks tend to do well. I mean, this is just based on history. When you look at sector outperformance, there is a clear differentiation in terms of what the person who's the president tends to favor from, an, from a governmental perspective, right? So, you know, you end up having Trump go in there. Yeah, probably the energy sector is going to really rock it even more so, and technology takes a back seat. This is more of a longer term argument. Uh, if if Biden were to win, you know, yeah, maybe technology does continue, right? Um, I, I don't, I don't think any of that will matter because no matter who's in office, we know one thing for sure: they're both going to keep spending, mm. right? The, the 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 they're both going to increase the the debt load even more, and it, we're all screwed no matter what. Well, I've heard that if Trump gets in office, he has said on the campaign trail, whether or not he actually delivers the second issue. But he has said that he wants to strike a peace deal in the Middle East. He wants to negotiate with Putin and the war in Ukraine. If, I'm not saying it'll happen, but if these two wars de-escalate, that's very bearish for oil, is it not? Well, I guess it depends on the demand side then. I mean, you, yeah, probably probably initially, right? But, you know, I I, I don't know, man. I, I am skeptical of so many narratives out there, and I'm, I'm skeptical of so many things that any presidential candidate says and what they can actually do sure i think i think the world is so complex and so hard to really think through that it's more about butterflies than 
than uh, flapping their wings, creating hurricanes than anything that's obvious. Tell us about the lead leg report. What are you researching right now? What are you focused on? Yeah, well, I've been writing about gold actually quite a bit uh, uh, more recently, but leadlagreport.substack.com, risk signals, high yield ideas, macro observations. It goes beyond the persona that people see on X, which is a persona. It's an act. It's not the way I actually am, as you can hopefully probably tell. Much more seizure, serious research. Uh, I want to get you actually on my YouTube channel. You know, I want to reciprocate a little bit. I know you're killing it, but I want to get you on youtube.com slash at leadlagreport as well. Uh, but Substack is the easiest way, leadlagreport.substack.com. And like I said, X, Instagram, YouTube, threads. Uh, pretty much everywhere I can be annoying is uh, is what I like to say. All right. Well, I'm not as smart as you, but I'm happy to participate. But and, uh, you're, de- and you're definitely not as annoying as, as I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. It really depends on who you ask in my life. <laughs> but okay. oh, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds uh, like a you problem, but yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it is. Michael, follow Michael Gayed in the links down below on X and in the Substack and the YouTube channel. We'll put the links in the description. Thank you very much, Michael. Speak to you soon. Appreciate it.